We're still in John 2, but we're just going to do a summary, but you can turn there if you'd like to. I, uh, anybody enjoy that last class? It was, you know, it's been the buildup of this whole course so far to get to this point, so it's like I was hoping the payoff would <laughs> be worth it, but it, it really was ne necessary to build in the way that I did so that we could... Uh, see the full picture. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so we're just going to uh, <clears throat> read a little summary here on uh, John 2 and really on the chart. So when I talk about the chart, I'm talking about this one right here. And I think it's the only one I've passed out recently anyway. <clears throat> um, so we may conclude that this reaction on the part of Jesus of driving out these things was not the result of anger, but of zeal pertaining to the house of God. And that zeal was a desire to move from Jesus just being incarnated as the tabernacle of God, the only one, and to die on the cross and to rise again with his resurrection body and that body include all of us, the church, the, those who are filled with his life <clears throat> and function as his body. So uh, it was not zeal for religion, <clears throat> which I, I wrote that down because a lot of people read this little thing of Jesus driving these guys out of the temple and they go, oh man, Jesus was really committed. He just, you know, he, he, he didn't mind looking bad to people, you know, but he's going to right what's wrong. Folks, that action had nothing to do with zeal for religion. It had zeal for this house right here. And instead of it truly representing anger or <clears throat> straightening everybody else out by using force, it represented him willingly laying down his life, his life going out of that temple, destroying that temple and the resurrection body of the, te of the, of the church um, being what comes forth. That's just the, that spirit is just the opposite of, well, Jesus will straighten them out. I mean, bless God, they're wrong. And <clears throat> so that wasn't what was going on. Not not zeal for religion, not zeal for good versus evil, but for the house of God, a habitation for God. <clears throat> um, and I wrote in parentheses that in Christ's death, a greater temple would come. Um, <clears throat> this spirit in which Jesus did this was totally enveloped in this desire to give God a house. <clears throat> now remember the next, the next one we're going to deal with is the, actually the one after, um, uh, before the Solomon's temple, but after his resurrection, and that is David's tabernacle. <clears throat> and David also had a zeal, a desire to give God a habitation. And so there is a ongoing spirit because that spirit is Christ, because that spirit is not people getting dedicated to some concept of us being a habitation of God or some doctrine of Christ in you or some teaching of, you know, well, you're dead and Christ is your life. It is not a zeal for all that stuff. It is, it is the absolute zeal that is in the heart of Jesus for a habitation and for a habitation for his father also. <clears throat> um, so, um, so, he, so this driving out of the temple represented death, represented now the transition's going to happen. This is going to happen and certainly it did. I mean, what did Jesus say? Destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. Guess what? The actual event happened. He died in three days, it rose up, and we were then his body. I mean, the real deal happened. <clears throat> uh, I was talking with somebody about this recently, about 
how the, the New Testament really, really and truly, the New Covenant does not begin until the resurrection. Uh, the beginning of the church, that's the beginning of it. Um, <clears throat> the people who put the Bible together chose to put the Gospels in what's called the New Testament, but the word New Testament is also the word New Covenant. And the new covenant doesn't begin till the resurrection. Y'all following that, what I'm saying here? So how would you put those books in the new covenant when they're not, a, are you, you get that? How would you put them in the new covenant? I can see you, I can understand you putting it in a section of books called the New Testament. But they shouldn't be called the New Testament if you're putting things that are pre-cross, pr certainly pre-resurrection. All right, <clears throat> so doesn't it make sense that Jesus driving out the money changers and doing all that really was, uh, and in truth, he didn't, he wasn't. I mean, more importantly, he was demonstrating his death and that that would be more of a shadow picture than the actual event that took place at the cross. Why? Because the, the new hasn't come yet. He's only demonstrating the shadow of it. But it's a pretty clear shadow. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> remember how in verse 18, so let's remember verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that, that, seeing that thou doest these things? Whatever things that you just did with all this mess, driving these things out and all that, tell us what it all means. Remember how in verse 18, they want to know the meaning of why Jesus did these things. In type and shadow, he was showing the destruction of the temple by removing its inward life. This is exactly what the Jews would do to Jesus. They would destroy this temple by crucifying or, in other words, driving out the life within. They will not drive out the idols, but... Like at Shiloh, they will take the life out of the tabernacle by giving it over into the Philistines. And it's, a, it's exactly the same picture because the taking of the ark is exactly the same picture of this transition that took place at the cross. And that's why so many things line up. And I will say this, I only hit upon some of the top things there uh, with the taking of the ark and how it represents the cross and everything. It, there's still some fertile ground there if y'all ever want to go back and just, you know, dig around some more. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> when the life is removed from the temple of his body, the temple is destroyed. When the ark was taken out of the tabernacle for all intents and purposes with God, that was it. Ichabod. The glory has departed. You know, you could, you could hear God in the fading distance as that took place saying, I ain't coming back. I will not be returning to this system, to this structure, uh, whether that be the old covenant system or whether that be Jesus incarnate, he's not going to come back and live in the way that we think. I mean, I, I, I don't want to get too much into all that, but I will just tell you flat out, most people think Jesus is coming back just like he walked the earth. And Jesus died to that individual identity. And we talked about this, what, last week, that he is now the head of a body. He's a member of the body just like we are. But the body is us in this manner. <clears throat> I won't rehash all of that. Um, so this period where the ark was in the hands of the Philistines represents the spiritual meaning of the times of the Gentiles. All right. In this chart, if you'll notice, um, uh, the progression that I have on the historical part from Abraham representing individuals offering to God, to the Moses' tabernacle, which represented more of a corporate thing, to Shiloh uh, and the taking of the ark, 
to David's tabernacle, and then to Solomon's temple. That's the progression that we, we're that's the progression that we're following in this. And if you'll notice the bottom part, spiritual progression of the house of God, this is the actual spiritual reality that the other is just a shadow and points to. God in heaven, Jesus incarnate, Jesus dying on the cross, Jesus in resurrection, and then the reality of that resurrection being the body of Christ, the church. <clears throat> um, under incarnation, which represented Jesus tabernacled among us, and he represented the true tabernacle of God. We have Christ as the tabernacle of God. This is Emmanuel. This is God with us. <clears throat> All other references to Emmanuel are not really, even when Jesus was incarnated, what did they call him? I mean, when he was born in the earth, baby, little baby Jesus. This is, she'll call his name Man. Bob, that's right. <laughs> Well, some of you, the way you're looking at me, I'm wondering what, what we got working here. Emmanuel. God with us. Okay. He was God with us. But folks, did everything get perfect from that point on? No. So there's more, there's more of an understanding of that than what we understand. And God with us and the true fulfillment of that is seen in the Gospels as far as him walking with man, teaching, praying, healing, all the things that he can do with us but is not the, the reality of him in us. And this is the big transition that we're going to be getting into coming up. That is the difference between Jesus incarnate Jesus incarnate, meaning God right here with us, and Christ in us. <clears throat> the, the difference, folks, and I want you to consider, I want you to consider something, just for just a thought, maybe a seed. If God with us, like he, the way he was in the Gospels, was it. Well, where did he go? Why? I mean, if that was such a good plan, where the heck is he? I mean, you know, I mean, he, he was, as far as we knew, he was really only around three and a half years. That's really not long. I mean, he was here for 30 years before that, but we didn't know much about him. Three and a half years and, you know, God with us. And if that thing works so well and everybody's looking forward to it happen again, why are we waiting thousands of years or what if God with us was not it, was never meant to be it, and that God's plan, ultimate plan, ultimate plan, because this shows the progression of the house of God, the ultimate plan was Christ in us, not with us, Christ in us. And if that were the plan, What if the church has been fed a steady diet of pray that Jesus will be with us and has never really focused in on this reality of the life of Christ within us to, you know, for dependence, for life, for fruitfulness, for all of those things and looking away? And what if God with us, God knew that that wasn't, the ultimate plan. And so when Jesus died, he ended. He ended that tabernacle relationship and expects us to find a new relationship in son. I mean, ended it. We, we think he just left. I mean, I mean, I'm just supposing here, but I mean, you know, we, we go, well, he just left. He'll be back. You know, he just said him <laughs> any minute now. Sure, it's been a couple of thousand years, but, you know, but I'm just saying, what, 
<laughs> I'm just saying. But what if? I, I'm not even telling you this is it. But what if it's exactly the same picture that happened with the taking of the ark and God ended that with that tabernacle and that was only a shadow and God ended that with our relationship trying to get hold of Jesus outside of us and wants us to come into a temple relationship. Just what if, you know. Just thinking here. <clears throat> All right. So... Um, so talking about the cross on our chart here, the times of the Gentiles, the rejection by Israel, and I, I call it the times of the uh, Gentiles strictly for this, this thing, the picture that I saw um, there with the taking of the ark. Uh, <clears throat> historically, you see them running out with the ark and going, we're going to win because God's with But spiritually, we see that they're actually... There's the, the malice behind it, just like in the Day of Atonement, laying on of hands, you don't see the malice, do you? It looks so sweet and innocent. And, but they're laying all of that, they're blaming Jesus as the scapegoat. And the high priest is doing that, not even knowing he's fulfilling the actual real thing while it's going on. You know, well, <clears throat> the, the same thing, that malice is not seen in the shadow. You can't see clearly that what that shadow is doing. So, so they're actually, the true reality of it is they're taking the life out of the tabernacle. They're killing Jesus and they're putting him into the hands of the Gentiles, the Philistines in this case, but the Gentiles for death. For death so that he'll die. Again, whatever their motives are, doesn't mess with the Lord. The Lord has a zeal and he's in this. That's why God gave me John 2, to show that he's in this full tilt because he knows that this step of being delivered into the hands of the Gentiles, this step is the necessary step for resurrection. You cannot have resurrection without death. Everybody wants resurrection. You know, people are walking around going, Oh, I want resurrection. But true resurrection doesn't happen, you know, uh, without death. That's why the term, I think, rapture got so popular instead of resurrection. You know, I'm mean, thinking about it. The, the term rapture is the big word because it doesn't imply death. <laughs> but resurrection demands death. <laughs> you can't have a resurrection without a death. So, <clears throat> um, so, so here we see in shadow form them taking the life out of the tabernacle, out of Jesus incarnate, and delivering him to the Gentiles. And here you see the times of the Gentiles, meaning they're in charge now with Jesus. They are in charge, and they can do with him as they please. And you see the rejection by Israel, rejected his life, rejecting his kingship, rejecting all that he's taught and everything. <clears throat> and so you have a picture of the cross. You have a picture of their end of the, the, the thing. <clears throat> and again, always hearkening back, there's never one side to this thing. There's always God's side. And any time you get sideways over any issue, folks, nine times out of ten, it involves man and maliciousness and people and junk and somebody did me wrong and da-da-da-da. And, and while all that may be true, there is another side that if you'll just step into the lamb, you'll find answers because there are no answers on that side of the equation. You know, all you see is, well, this is just wrong. You know what I mean? And, and, and I understand that. Only until you see the God side of these issues where you see the zeal of the Lord for his house. You see the zeal for death because death will destroy that temple and bring forth that tabernacle and bring forth this temple. You see that? And he's, Jesus is so given to that, so dedicated to that, came for that, for, you know, you know. What does this say? Um, now, Jesus said just before he died, now is my soul troubled. Okay, well, that means Jesus had soul trouble just like we do. Shock. Shock and all. Now is my soul troubled. And But what shall I say then? See, here's us. We don't go 
and what shall I say? And we, but he says, now is my soul, but what shall I say then? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. And that is a spirit, it is a reality of God that is not a brain thing, and it's not, a, it's not even a doctrinal thing. It is a spirit in relationship to the living God and how he proceeds and how he wants to proceed. And so um, he, he, you know, I, I'm just going to say it like this. He doesn't just embrace death. My God. He, he, he grabs it. He lays hold of it because he knows if you have any zeal for the house of God, that's the way you got to go right there. That's it. You know, you want God to have a habitation. Now, if you want you to have a habitation with a picket fence, that's a different story. But if your heart's like, you know, David and, and, and Paul and, and all of those who have uh, brushed the Holy Spirit enough to get that reality rubbed off on you, you know that I, that I am not afraid of this road because I know exactly where it leads. I know what the purpose is. I, it, it is, while it is temporarily, you know, a nightmare, joy cometh in the morning. You know, though weeping may endure for a night, joy cometh in the morning. <clears throat> All right. And so, let's see. Let me... Uh, read a little bit here because I'm talking a lot. So we see from our chart on the historical and spiritual progression of the house of God that the incarnation was represented by Moses' tabernacle, the cross was represented by the taking of the ark from the tabernacle at Shiloh, and that the raising up of Solomon's temple shortly after these events represent the new temple, the resurrected body of Christ, the church. If this is so, then we must consider our Christian experience in light of these shadows. And, and that's, you know, I think that's the problem is that we just hear, we hear such sweet teachings, you know, like honeycombs, just full of stuff. And we never take that into uh, the, the light of our true Christian experience. We just learn stuff. When Israel had the tabernacle in their midst, it was the time of their wilderness wanderings. <clears throat> now, I know you. everybody doesn't have this chart. I hope you remember, if nothing else, that the historical thing is just given the historical events that happened in order progressing to the temple, the house of God in a progression. The bottom one is giving a spiritual progression in relationship to Christ and in relationship to Christ and his body. And so when we said that Jesus tabernacled among us and that was the true tabernacle of God and the only true tabernacle of God at that time, the only true. So there, the real had come not... Um, uh, 2,000 years before that, whatever happened in the wilderness, that shiny thing over the you know, tent called the Shekinah Glory, folks, it was nothing. It was, it was just a vague shadow of the fulfillment, Jesus walking, the first one, the true and living tabernacle of God, the incarnate, Christ. <clears throat> but if you if you consider that, if you if you believe that then, I mean if you if you come to that conclusion that that really was the case, then there's a couple other conclusions that you end up having to come to also. And that is that when Israel had the tabernacle in their midst, it was the time of their wilderness wanderings. What conclusion would you come to with this? Well, that means to only have God with us And if we're still relating to God in that manner, we're wilderness wanderers. You have to conclude that. I mean, I mean, it's better to chunk the whole thing out and say, I'm a heretic. <laughs> but if you don't, 
there's only certain conclusions you have to come to, and you have to come true to that the wilderness wanderings were a shadow just like everything else in the Old Covenant, and the true fulfillment of that is going on right now. People relating to God with us instead of Christ in us. People relating to the tabernacle of among us as opposed to the temple of which we are part and parcel and member and stone and, you know, that, that sort of thing. Yes? Why does it have to include wilderness wanderings? Because even the people subsequent to all of that still lived under the God with us, even after exile coming back. Why specifically does it have to conclude they are wilderness wanderers? Just understand what you're Well, of course, you missed the last couple of classes that we had, but the main reason is, is because if, if this time period here really is the taking of the ark, and if this really does represent Christ incarnate in the tabernacle as the tabernacle of God and the only true tabernacle of God, then this manifestation of the only true tabernacle of God in type and in shadow took place when they were in the wilderness. And I believe Hebrews tries to bring this out. I think Hebrews is trying to bring out that he's not just talking to us about Israel back then. He's talking about now. Beware that the things that that represented doesn't befall you now. Yes. And with the tabernacle, they never were really fully established in the land until, you know, David and the Holy yes. of Holies. They, I mean, they still were kind of wilderness. Even though they had gone into the Jordan, right. even though they had gone in by Joshua, there were still real governmental issues there sure. as far as, well, it was me, almost wildernessy, if yeah. you will, you know. Well, I think I see what both of y'all are asking now. Yeah, I think I see what you're asking. And, and that is, um, you know, no type or shadow fully matches to the, to the deal. Um, the, the ark or the, the uh, tabernacle was in the land for a period of time. It's a fairly short period of time, but it was in the land for a period of time. But the main thing, uh, there's no real story around that, hardly at all. The real story of the ark is in the wilderness where you see God coming down, you see them experiencing God. He's right there in their midst. He speaks to them. He corrects them. He's doing all this stuff. And yet they're continuing to fail and to fail and to fail, even with God with us. My Lord, what a huge step from before. Now God is with us, and yet they're completely failing on every front. Okay. That is a true picture of Christianity. Wilderness wanders if they're only relating to him in that way. If they're only relating to him in that way, yes. Uh, this may be kind of a strange question and maybe for some other time, but, and I know it's not exact, but they all had to come together then. Joshua had to lead them all together. And I, I guess I, I, it's strange for me then, like, if there's those believers who begin to see this and begin to walk in this it's it's not it's not enough to spy out the land and say that and even believe to go in when you believe that but yet but that we all come and that we all come together and i guess yeah what does that sorry for the question what does that mean for us as a body it's maybe more of a rhetorical question a, mm -hmm. a pensive question you know what i mean um what does that mean for us uh, or for anyone who is walking in this and is seeing this, is it for, is it not time for you to go into that that it, we must be it's with? It's not because we deal with that mainly over here in Solomon's yeah. temple. But a, a point that while you were talking that I think is important, and that is to realize that though they entered the land with this, and though they, uh, and in a certain sense you could say the tabernacle took them in, Right? Jesus took them in. But th I think the problem where we stumble is we think that the taking of the land is what it's all about. And God thinks it's the building of a temple for his habitation. And that's where we miss it. So, so we're experiencing all this stuff even in the land. But think about it. I mean, they're still just as flaky as, you know, yes. There's no real easy to follow 
No. And no. Was, they were still, un, that's they're still unstable. Things were kind of up and down, even through David's reign. But well, Solomon absolutely. is when it's just solid. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's not teach Solomon's temple yet. But <laughs> But anyway, these are these are good questions and they're important questions. Yes. I'm just thinking this is just for clarification from my own mind, I guess, but the taking of the land based on that last statement that you made is more about like um, you know, filling it up and casting out the enemies and everything. That's you kind of see that as a picture, I see that as a picture of getting to some degree, getting the junk out of me and you know what I mean? It's kind of like the taking of the land is about me. But the building of the temple is about him and what he needs and what he desires. Yeah. Can we just shut up about Solomon's temple now? You're starting to cover all my materials here. And <laughs> I, you know, what I'll do is I'll have class next week and I'll go, well, there it is. You know what it's about. <laughs> all right. Um, so I've said some of these things, but I hadn't read this. So Emmanuel was, was with them, dwelling in his own tabernacle, but not yet in them. Amen. This is equated with the incarnation as well as the kind of relation Christians have with Jesus when he only lives with them, but he is not the life in the temple. And he was the life in the tabernacle, but that was his own personal body. To be the life in the temple means he's the life of every believer. Okay? Um, like the disciples with Jesus in their midst, you, you do remember how the di disciples were, even though Jesus was in their midst, right? All holy and perfect. and <laughs> Yeah, sanctified. Uh, like the disciples with Jesus in their midst, Israel continued to fail, even though he was right there with them. From this, we should conclude that God with us is not enough. And, and especially, and if that upsets anybody, stick with me because we're going somewhere. That's not the end of it. Um, it's not enough. We must have Christ living in us. If these things be so, then we are also to conclude that we are still in the wilderness spiritually until we live by Christ in us. I don't think that's such a big leap for most of us who teach this and have lived around. You know, we've already taught that. You know, being a wilderness wanderer is, you know, trying to get hold of the Lord in this way and that entering into the land, although the fullness of that is not the land but the temple, but enter, entering into the land is entering into Christ and that does represent the temple in Christ, in union with him. <clears throat> um, in other words, the events Israel experienced in the wilderness, along with all the experiences of failing God, were only a shadow that points to the true reality. And the true reality is that those Christians who have God in their life, but not as their life, are the true explanation of being wilderness wanderers. Are they God's people? Yes. Have they come out of Egypt? Yes. But there is a promised land in which God plans to build them into a glorious habitation for his life, the temple that they have not yet entered into. Yes. Jesus also, uh, that time is is where man can put his hands to. Yeah. I would say the other part, but <laughs> but that's you know in in every man can put his hand yeah. to it. Right. All right, last paragraph on this little subject. In the wilderness, the law is given to Israel, but it is not in them until the new covenant, right? In the wilderness, right when they got the tabernacle, the law was given to them, and that's Jesus who is the law of it, but he hadn't imparted the law of his life yet. So he says, go the extra mile, you know, turn the other cheek, and, and uh, it's the law, but it's not in them yet. <clears throat> So if you ever wonder why you have trouble with certain things. Um, so um, let's see, the one, oh, let's see. In the wilderness, the, the uh, law is given to Israel, but it's not in them until the new covenant. In the incarnation, Jesus, in accord with the law of God and as the example of it, but he is not, he is not yet in the believer yet. The true wilderness wanders are the disciples, both then and now, who follow him outwardly, but the law of his life does not control them yet. 
<clears throat> so, I mean, in one sense, that's just true across the board, whether somehow you, you know, there's lines of the wilderness are entering into the promised land. The true wilderness wanderers have God in a tabernacle instead of having him in them as a temple. <clears throat> All right, I am going to, uh, well, gosh, there's some good stuff here, and it's just a couple of paragraphs, but it could take longer. And it's 9 o'clock. So what I'm going to do next class is I'm going to finish off this thing of, of the taking of the ark uh, by dealing with um, the ark's experience with the Philistines where he spoiled principalities and powers. <clears throat> um, and then after that, we will get into the tabernacle of David because there is an interim thing that happens between this cross and Solomon's temple. The ark came back after this event that we're going to talk about and was in David's tabernacle for a period of time until the temple was built. And what does that represent? We need to, we need to look at that. Father, we just ask you to open our hearts and our eyes and to keep us hungry for you. Father, I realize that uh, there's a lot here and that even my own comprehension of everything is not always adequate, but may you be ever faithful, Holy Spirit, to lift up Christ even beyond uh, my sharing or even beyond the subject that we have here. You are so precious to lift up Jesus. So, Father, keep our hearts open, we ask. Move on us. Prepare us for each and every class so that we may take the biggest drink from you that we can get. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.